along with the topics, right? And then on the, the back side, on the, on the whole thing over there is the sponsor form. So I really, I, everybody needs a sponsor to go into the program. And then behind that sponsor form, fill out form, is like kind of the requirements for the sponsor. So I'm a convert to Catholicism as well, and my husband was my sponsor whenever I came through RTIA. Um, if you don't know anybody that is like a super faithful Catholic that you really admire, I can give you some um, options for sponsors. I can sponsor someone, anyone here on the team can sponsor. Uh, but so, uh, so we'll be thinking about that. Okay, so let me, oh, it's already recording, wonderful. Let me share my screen. That way we can do this. Okay, so we are gonna start off with some pretty general questions, but before I get beyond myself, let me go ahead and open us with a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Dear God, thank you for your loving presence. Lord, we know that there is nowhere that we can go where you are not. And I thank you that you are always with us from today, for forever, from yesterday, today, and always. God, as we enter into this space of learning and of opening ourselves up to be aware of your presence, I pray that our hearts might be burning with, with fervor for you. I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that we, you would make yourself known to us and that we would encounter you in a new and very real way today, uh, beginning today and forever. And I just ask all these things in Christ's name, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so today we're going to start talking about like, who is God, right? That's a really big general concept. But when we look around and we see the creation ourself, itself, the creation itself is divine manifestation, right? God said, God spoke, and creation boosted, right? And so the creation is God's handiwork. And so we can look around at just the universe and creation itself and know that there is a God. The scriptures tell us that. Everything that you need to know is here in front of you from creation itself. It is divine manifestation. It is the, the fingerprints of an almighty God. There is no way that we can look at the creation and the mathematical precision with which the universe create and is and continues to grow and not think that there's got to be something more than what we just see in front of us. So we are without excuse. There is a God. There is. Now, all the words that we have to describe him, all of those things. Let's talk a little bit about that. So manifestation, this is an event or an action or an object that clearly shows or embodies something, especially a theory or an abstract idea. God is pure spirit. God is abstract. But a manifestation is a concrete showing of something that is abstract. And so we know that the creation itself is divine manifestation. It's something theoretical, made real. It is something spiritual becomes real. It is said to be a manifestation. A manifestation of the spirit of God, right? Something that God did that then shows you in reality. And so we hear that word manifestation. It is a concrete realization of something abstract or spiritual. So the miracle of the creation is proof of a creator. So here's the lesson of the Legos. And I like to give this to middle school students and young high school students because it's just it's kind of like, that's stupid. Why would you even say that? You have a box of Legos, right? And every Lego piece that you would need to make a plane is in this box, right? Mathematically, could I shake that box in such a way that that plane would just happen to happen. Mathematically, it is possible. It is possible. If once the Googleplex, which is the tiniest fraction of a statistic, almost impossible, right? And that is why scientists who are not believers in something higher than themselves want to make us believe that that, that, that infinitely small possibility of all of the elements just shook together in the right exact way, all, you know, and all, and all the things that we see are here. That's preposterous. That's preposterous. So we know that the creation, and even, even scientists, if you get a, a, a true scientist who is looking, especially 
actually at the universe? Those astro astronomers who are looking way out in the universe and, and looking at these telescopes that look so far out in the history. So when we look at the stars, we are looking at the past. Y'all know that, right? It takes thousands and thousands of light years for the light from a star to reach our eyes. When we see the night sky, we are looking at the past. And so scientists who are truly honest, the more they learn about how big the universe is, how old the universe is, the more they're like, you know, there's got to be something more. There's got to be some intelligent designer behind that. So that's the lesson of the Legos. And if you want a little bit more um, about this, there's a YouTube link that you can watch. It's a mathematician talking about how God is a mathematician, right? If we look at math. And so whenever I taught school, um, I taught science and I taught religion. For me, those two things go hand in hand. And I say, what is science? Science is the study of the creation. Biology is the study of life. Physics is the study of movement and energy. Astronomy is the study of the stars. You know, chemistry is the study of chemical reactions. It is the study of creation. If in our study of creation, it does not lead us to the creator, we are doing science wrong. We're doing it wrong. And so that was my first speech on my first day in biology class or physics or whatever grade that I was teaching because I was in a Catholic school, so I was able to, to bring those conversations into the classroom. And so this math, math, math is simply the creation in numerical symbol. We are expressing the creation in numerical symbol. Did you know that stars have equations that go with them? The math of stars. The mathematical equation of fetal development in the womb. There is a mathematical equation that goes along with that. That is a mathematician. A mathematician. It's amazing how just his ways are so high. His thoughts are so far above ours. So God is infinitely large and infinitely small at the same time. We are taught this with the, uh, the parable of the mustard seed, right? When Jesus talks about that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, the tiniest of all seeds, and yet when it's fully grown, is the largest of all plants. I have some real mustard seeds from the Holy Land in my calendar. I'll have to bring you some next time. It looks like dirt. I, I got mustard seeds from Blows one time, and they're like for mustard green, and they're pretty small, but these ones that I got from the Holy Land, I'm telling you, it looks like dirt in a bag, and these tiny, tiny grains of like sand almost, and that's, just, that's the seed that Jesus is talking about. So Jesus talks about, this is that paradox of nothing is big and nothing is little. Everything that is big is little and everything that is little is big. So when we think about the creation and how big the universe is and how tiny, how tiny. And then I also do this timeline with some kids where I do the timeline of salvation history and it's like a 50 foot ribbon. And on that 50 foot ribbon, I show church history is like, whoop. Right? And then there's this one little thought of Jesus. Who steps out of eternity and into time. And he is everything and everywhere and all at once. And one with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Blow your mind kind of stuff, right? So God is infinitely large, infinitely small. He is past, he is here, and he is future. He always is, always was, and always will be. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is what it means when God reveals himself to Moses' I am. In the burning bush, right? I am who I am. I am presence and existence itself. This is what he means when he says, I am. So this, so the infinitely large, infinitely small, the God that is I am, the God who is present in it all. From the tiniest iota beyond an atom, right? The sm even smaller, even the the building blocks of the atom. I mean, just that infinitely tidiness. God is there, and God is in the far reaches of the universe. And this is I am. So, now I said that the creation is divine manifestation, right? And then I went into a whole bunch of stuff that we know about God, right? From what? How do I know those things? That God is infinitely big, infinitely small, I am, who I am. The mustard seed from scripture, right? From the word of God. Okay. So 
Who is God? God is behind all of it. God is in all of it. He is the one who is with us. And we can know that just by looking at the creation. But there are some things that we can't not know unless he reveals it to us. And this is called divine revelation. God himself must speak himself to us because there are things that we cannot know without him teaching us. And as Christians, as Catholics, that started with the Old Testament, with the Jewish people, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's all of salvation history. For thousands of years, God has been slowly revealing who he is to us. So, growth, it's not this, oh, right? When I was Baptist, I wanted the two second, like, let me tell you in two seconds why I'm right, you're wrong, why you're, you know, it didn't matter who it was. They were Catholic, I felt really bad. I was like, oh my goodness, you are very good. Let me tell you about Jesus and about how he's saved, right? And so, but there are some things about God that we cannot know unless he teaches them to us. And this is why Christianity, this is why. Because as Christians, we posit some pretty, some pretty heady stuff. We say that religion, well, we do know, religion is simply a man's search for the infinite. Religion is not a new concept. But what makes Christianity the right one, right? When we look at the past and thousands of you've got the Egypt gods, you've got the Greek gods, you've got the Native Americans that are digging holes in the ground and like worshiping the creation and stuff. We are made for the infinite. And so that is what religion is. It is us seeking that infinite. And so that's all it is. But why is Christianity the right one? Well, Christianity says some pretty important stuff, some pretty, you know, like, mind-blowing things. We say that God is knowable. We say that God is knowable. We say that God wants to know us. We say that God has revealed himself to us. And God began his self-revelation with a specific people, namely the Jewish people. So those are some claims that we make as Christians. God is knowable. God is not a God of chaos, but a God of order. God wants to know us. God has opinions about how we live our life. And God started his self-disclosure with a certain people group. You guys can know who I am simply by looking at me, right, and why. But you may not know me. You won't know me unless you meet my husband, my children, unless I tell you my story about who I am. You can't know any of that unless I share that with you. And God is the same. And Christians, we say, God wants to know us. And there was this atheist website that I was listening to one time, and maybe it was a blog post, and, and this atheist was saying, you know, Christianity is preposterous. It says that of all the bigness of the universe, God came and he wants to know you. Yeah. He wants to know me. He wants to know you. And the thing is, is that he already does. He already does. The scriptures teach us certain things. Like, I mean, he already knows. He knows when we sleep, he rise. He knows um, the words that are on our mouth from here to there. He knows the hairs of our head. He counts the tears that we cry, and he holds them in his hand. They matter to him. They matter. And this atheist thought that that was just preposterous. And I felt so sad for them because I thought, do you not think that you're worth knowing? Maybe so. Maybe so. I believe that they are worth knowing, and I wish that I could talk to them and say that to them face to face. Ergo, the, uh, some of the breakdown of communication of the internet, which is why I hate it so much. Okay. We also posit this crazy thing that God became one of us. That he stepped out of eternity into the timeline. That little blue dot on my long ribbon of time. And so that's crazy. That's crazy. Okay. And he also wants us forever, right? All those things about the, the goodness of God and the desire for relationship. Okay, so in divine manifestation, which is the creation, we know that God exists. We cannot know God unless he reveals himself to us. And therefore, we look at covenant. God is a God who promises. God is a covenant maker. A covenant is more than a contract. A covenant says, I'm going to do some stuff, you're going to do some stuff, and we're going to be a family forever. It makes family. 
people are exchanged. The marriage relationship is the perfect example of what this is. I, when I said yes to marry my husband, I told him, I give you all of myself. I no longer belong to me. I belong to you. He no longer belongs to himself. He belongs to me. And we have exchanged personhood, right? And in that exchange, he promises to do some pretty important stuff, right? Ephesians chapter 6. I will die for you. I promise to do some pretty hard stuff too. I will submit to you as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of his wife, as is Christ is head of the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. We always want to get stuck on the submission part, and we don't talk about what the man has to do. Yeah. I was in a morality class or a, an ethics class at Southeastern in my undergrad, and this, we were talking about Aristotle and morality and ethics and stuff. And so I, we were talking about this here passage, and all the women in my, my, my female teacher were like all up in arms. And you know what, guys? I raised my hand. Like, you show me. You show me a man who loves his wife the way Christ loves his church, and I will show you a wife that will see it all day long. That kind of love is compelling. When someone stands before you, when my husband stands before me and offers his life to me, do whatever you want to me. And with me, I might give you my life, I give you my dreams, I give you my hopes, I give you my fears, I give you my failures, I give you my successes, I give my whole self to you. The last thing I want to do is control him. The last thing I want to do is to take that gift and squander it. I look at him like, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. I'm like, well, what can I do for you? How can I help? How can I help? Okay, this is how God loves us. I offer you my everything. I give you my whole self. But what does he want in return? He give you your whole self. That. To him. <laughs> beautiful. I mean, a marriage as this walking, talking, living, breathing image of that kind of love. This is who God is. Over and over and over again, he makes covenants after covenants after covenant. There are seven major covenants in the Bible. The first one was with Adam and Eve. The next one was with Noah and the flood. Then we have uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all of salvation history. I have a really awesome uh, picture of it right here. It's thousands and thousands of years of God's self-disclosure to mankind and how he loves us. So here is my Bible timeline. So if you want to look at that or take a picture of it, and you can look at it later. So this is the big story, right? So this is the God that we serve. We would not know that had he not revealed himself that way, right? Divine revelation. The Testament. So the Bible, you've got the Old Testament, which are the Old Covenants. And you have the New Testament, which is the New Covenant. We still operate under a covenant today, and it's the covenant in Christ. Whereas before in the Old Covenant, the Old Promises, if we fail to, uh, to do our side of the bargain, what was the consequence? Yes. 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 You, yes. yes. You are no longer part of the family, right? The lepers, the leprosy people, they were cast out, but they were unclean. If you didn't do all the things, you were cast out. And also, when the Israelites continued to disobey God, what happened to them? They were sent to the desert, right? When they actually came into the promised land and they did, did well, then they would disobey God, disobey the covenant, worship other gods. Other people would come in, take over them. They would, Their wives wouldn't have children. Their crops wouldn't have fruits and they produce and, and they would they would suffer right because in the old covenant when, when we broke the covenant when the jewish people broke the covenant the consequences were there if you don't i said before you life and death blessings and cursings choose life god says if you don't choose this way you're gonna be taken over and that's what happened in the babylonian exile finally finally the north and the south civil war right History is just a big circle, guys. I just keep repeating and repeating and repeating. This is the same for the Israelites. The north and the south broke it into two different kingdoms. The south had the temple. The north didn't. The north got even worse and worse faster. They all dispersed. And now we have this diaspora of Jewish people. Where we don't know where like 11 or 10 or 10 or 11 of the tribes go to. We have the tribe of Judah in the south. That's where King David was. All the kings came to the tribe of Judah. In the south, continued in disobedience until the Babylonians came in and they hauled them off into slavery. Again, here we are for the second time, hauled off into slavery because they disobeyed the covenant. 
So the Old Testament is this story over and over and over and over and over again. Not the Old Covenant. Well, then Jesus comes to usher in the New Covenant. The New Covenant in Christ, where we have grace. We have access to the throne. We don't have to stand at a distance from a holy God. We can come to the holy God face to face and see him. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So, the Testament. We have the Old Testament, which is the Old Covenant, and the New Testament, which is the New Covenant in Christ. Covenants are a sign. They are a sign. A physical sign, a manifestation of God's love for us. And they also are sacramental. As Catholics, we are a sacramental people. The manifestation, right, the concrete realization of faith. It's both and. It's a sign. It points to something. And it is the thing. It's a sacrament. It is the thing that is supposed to, that it's supposed to be. Right? Um, we're going to go a little bit more into sacrament. Sacrament, like the, the official definition, is a, a physical sign of, of, a, of a reality that actually exists. It's an efficacious sign of God's work on earth. That means it does the thing that it says it does. Right? So just for example, confession. We don't pretend to just be forgiven. When we go and we say our sins out loud, we are concretizing something that might be very abstract. The idea of sin is abstract. But when we commit a sin, that's a very concrete realization. When we say our sin out loud, we are owning in time and space something concrete that we have done. And we on, on earth, concretely, in time and space, apply that grace that God pours out for us. In confession, it's a sacrament. It does the thing that we say it does. We go, we say our sins, the, the priest hears our sins, he stands in persona de Christe, in the person of Christ. He reconciles us to God, Jesus reconciles us to himself and to the church. It is concrete, it is in time and in space. That grace, that abstract notion, is applied concretely in our lives. So God is a God of covenant. He makes promises. He gives his whole self to us. He wants our whole self. God's revelation is given to us in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. God is a God, God that points, the signs point to God. And then the sacraments are the actuality of the manifestation of the grace of God happening in time and in space. This is the God that we serve. He's not some boo 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 boo. He's here in you and in me. In this working in and through us. So what about morality? So in this covenant, there are promises that are made and people are exchanged. God has an opinion about the way that we live our life. And so he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And there is responsibility to the one who promises, right? So God is making these promises. He's responsible to keep his promise but so are we. And so this is where the Ten Commandments come in, keeping the covenant. So in the Old Covenant, you have those Ten Commandments, those Ten Rules to Live Your Life By. We'll go over some of those. Um, and then the, the whole Mosaic Law. So you have the Ten Commandments, but then you had all these other laws, too, that encompass the Mosaic Law. One of, one of them that I thought was really funny is that if a husband mistreats his wife, um, and like divorces her for not for no reason, she can go and, and spit on him and take her shoe and slap him in public. That was part of the Mosaic law, right? Uh, the the food restrictions, all the dietary rules, uh, you know, um, the working on Sundays, like what you can and can't do. Those are all part of the Mosaic law, not encompassed in the Ten Commandments, but part of the Mosaic law. And that was keeping the covenant. That is recorded in the Old Testament, in the Book of Deuteronomy, um, Genesis, Exodus. Leviticus and Deuteronomy are the law, the books of the law. And so um, when we look at those laws, this is a, the Jewish people working out how they are going to worship God. And, and, and God laid out the parameters, spoke to Moses, spoke the Ten Commandments, and spoke to, uh, most of the Mosaic law to him. The ones that got written down were the Ten Commandments. And as this people became a people and became a community, this is where the New Old Testament came from. They wrote it. The people. Imagine that for this little Baptist girl who stood on sola scriptura for half of her life. Scripture alone. Scripture alone. Scripture alone crumbled for me and I almost walked away from my faith. How did it crumble? Because I figured out and realized that those scripture, even the most conservative understanding of authorship, it was Moses. 
Trojans wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, right? And you had the prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, writing the books of the prophets. And you had your minor prophets. And then you had your history books. The people who wrote that were the Jewish people. People. Now, yes, God it spoke to them through the Holy Spirit. It was divinely inspired. All of those things. But the reality is, is that I have to trust that that person heard God right. People are messed up. I include myself in people that are messed up. And so I had this crisis of faith because I said, God, I have to trust people? What? Not just the Bible, not just your word, that, that this person heard it correctly and wrote it down correctly? And he was like, yeah. I'm like, I don't think I can do that. We are really screwed up. He's like, yeah, you are. And I said, I can't do that. I can't trust a person. I don't even trust myself. He said, you know what? I do. I trust you. I have entrusted myself to Jesus. Moses, the Israelites, their whole history, Christians, you. He continues to entrust himself to people. And as the church, we are the divine manifestation of God on earth. Boosh! My goodness, our life should look different. People look at me and they say, you're so such a Jesus freak, you're so holy, you're so good. I'm like, you don't know my story. If I, if I was 18 or 19 standing up here, that same girl, and now you see, you would say that was impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. I have always been very interested in faith since I was a very little girl. But I went through a really dark time in my late teens, early 20s, even you know, right after I got married. It was dark, guys. It's dark. And the reason I had to go through that was because had I not experienced the darkness, then my testimony would not have as much power as it does because I give God all the glory for giving me light and bringing me out of that dark place. He has saved me, and I've known it since I was little. I knew all the right things, even in the darkness. I knew. And I'm like, ah, why aren't you here with me in the darkness? Where are you? You were there. He was allowing that. So that he would be glorified by my life. So that in the earth, on earth, I could be a divine manifestation of God's grace and power to bring me from that scared, sick, 17, 18, 19 year old girl who was, I was mentally sick, y'all. Like I had diagnosable neuroses. To the woman that you see, see here today, if there is anything beautiful, if there is anything lovely, if there is anything compelling about my life, it is God. It is God in and through me, and only Him, only Him. Okay, so that's the morality, right? If we are supposed to be and are who God calls us to be, the Ten Commandments then become a privilege rather than a burden. I want to live my life in accordance with what you are saying. It is a privilege and an honor to never use your name in vain, to worship you on Sunday, to live my life in chastity, not to lie, not to steal, not to covet, to respect other people and to give them the honor that's due them as being made in the image and likeness of God. We have got to look different in the world. Now, when we get to these arguments and things that, that inevitably come, right? We gotta do it better. We gotta fight better than the world, guys. When we disagree, which all will come, we gotta do it better. There's a beautiful laying out in scripture, like what do you do when you argue with somebody? What do you do when someone, your brother or sister in Christ, offends you? There's a beautiful way to move through that in grace and in holiness. Rather than to allow that those hurts to become bitter and for us to hate each other. My gosh, no, that's not what we're called to do. We're not talking about that today. <laughs> okay. So many religions have a moral duty. So lots of religions talk about like the moral way, you know, like the right way to live your life. But in every other religion, you have to do that in order to be preaching Nirvana, I thought, right? <laughs> Right? Like you have to do step one, two, three, four, and you must do that or else. 
in Christianity, it's not like that. It's not like that. We do have to live our life in a certain way. Not so that we can earn something, though. Because if we're not living our lives as followers of Christ, then has Christ really changed us? Right? But it's not I'm earning it. The morality is an outpouring of Jesus living in his kindness. It's an outpouring. Now, am I there all the time? No. Do I feel like I struggle with some certain um, commandments and virtues? Absolutely. But there are times when I do experience that level of just, it is a privilege to obey you, right? Obedience goes hand in hand with this relationship that Jesus said. If you say you know me, and you say you love me, yet you do not obey me, then you are a liar, and the truth is not in you. So that is where the morality piece comes in. We're not earning anything. Paul says that. Salvation is by faith through, uh, by, by grace through faith. And it is not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast, right? It's a, it's a gift. So our morality then is the outward expression of the manifestation of the relationship that we have with the Lord inside of us. And the sins that we struggle with over and over and over again are opportunities for God to pour out his power in us. In my weaknesses, God's strength is made perfect, Paul says. In my weakness. So I will boast all the more of my weaknesses so that God's strength and power can be manifest in my life. I will boast of them. So the moral duty is not so much of an earning thing as it is a transformation and a desire of the Christian that pours out of us, that, those rivers of living water that Jesus talks about at the well with the woman. Morality is simply divine character expre expressed through behavior. So the Ten Commandments are God's character in action. God's character in action. Think about that for a minute. If God's not asking us to, to tell the truth, then God is truth. If God is telling us to love our neighbor as ourselves, then that is how he loves. Jesus tells us this. When he washes the disciples' feet, he says, you don't know what I'm doing right now, but soon you will understand. And he takes off his clothes, wraps that thing around his waist, and he washes poop off of the disciples' feet. He's God. He's God. If God is saying, love your neighbors, he loves us like that. Jesus shows us that. He shows it. Go and do likewise, he says, right? If he's asking us, you know, like so much of just like chastity or, you know, the marriage laws or, you know, like all of the stuff that the, the, the society says, so that's an option, right? If we really dig deeper into that and we really look at God's character being expressed in that, that commandment, it's because that is how God loves. He will not take advantage. He is not going to use us. He is not going to look and say, hey, Aubrey, what do you have to offer me? And when I'm done with that, then I'm done with you. Right? That's the world's definition of love. You better make me happy and be the fun girl, Aubrey. Because the minute I'm not having fun anymore, next. That is not love. That is not love. And that is what our society puts forth as love. And it's not. So morality, moral behavior, no matter what it is, right, of the Ten Commandments, anytime we act morally, we are simply expressing God's character in time and in space concretely for the world to see. It's our purpose as the church. Okay, I love this word, metanoia. Metanoia. This is the journey of one's mind, heart, or self of a way of life. A spiritual conversion is a metanoia. This is when the Holy Spirit enlightens our, our intellect, and we have that moment of clarity. And we are speaking God, and we know he is speaking us. This can happen over and over and over again, but there has to be a first, there has to be a first awakening to this metanoia that there is something greater, and he is here, and he wants me, and he wants to, to reveal himself to me. And the other word for this is conversion is conversion. Okay, so a conversion is a profound change of heart. It's a turning away from sin and a turning toward God. 
there are thresholds of conversion, right? Okay, so this metanoia, for some people, everything happens all at once. For some, it's a journey, a lifetime journey, even. For some, it, it, you know, so each, each metanoia is unique to the person experiencing it. That's just the beauty of God and the creativity of God is that it's not all the same. But we can kind of break it down into three thresholds. There is initial trust. First, what faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the word of God. So first, our ears have to be open and have to hear. I can tell you how many times I'll try to share, and people just don't want to hear. They're like, I <laughs> If they're not open to hearing, how in the world is faith going to take root and grow in them? Right? And so when I see that, I don't want to be that kind of person either, right? Because a lot of times what I see in someone else is something that I do myself too, right? That plank in my own eye. But I judge those people, I know I do too. It got to me a couple of hours back to really convince me of that. But I'm very fully convinced. And anytime I start to feel offended or like irritated by a person, I'm like, okay, God, what are you, what mirror are you holding up right now? And so I try very hard to be a person who is quick to. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. So you are open with your ears and you hear someone talking. Or you hear like you read the scripture, you hear something. That and, and you trust it, right? I believe that what they're saying, I believe them. I or, or at the very minimum, I believe that they believe what they're saying, right? That would be the very minimum. Initial trust at what you're hearing. Then that trust then leads to curiosity. Well, oh, that's really interesting. They want to know more about that. Right? And so some more curiosity builds. And then you have spiritual openness where it's not just curious, but now you want that. Right? That was very compelling. I want that. I want that in my life. And then there is spiritual seeking where you want it. And then on your own, then you go searching for it. God says, when you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. You will. He promises. And so when we seek after him, we're going to find him. So we trust, then we're curious, then we're open. Then we're like, you know what? I want more of that. And we seek it on our own. And then that leads into intentional discipleship, where we are seeking Jesus every day, at every moment, for everything in our life. I want to know what his opinion is about everything that I do. Everything. And I remember when, when he had an opinion, that was a little too close for comfort. And I got really upset with him, and I was like, who gave you permission to be in that area of my life? My life. And he was like, and looked at me, and was like, oh, right, right. I did. <laughs> a long time ago, I said, Jesus, I want you to tell me everything. I gave you everything. I want to know what in my life you want me to change to make it what you want. And he was like, you said that. And I was well, yeah. You're right. I did. Okay, so we're um you have some prayer things about this prayer. Let's let's talk about prayer really quickly. Prayer is not something you do. Prayer is something that God does. So prayer is simply us opening ourselves up to what God is doing and how He wants to talk to us. Now, you know how Father says He already knows what we're going to say. So I've heard people say, "Well, then why don't we talk to Him?" He wants you to tell Him. He wants you to tell Him. So prayer is. It can be requesting things. It can be praying for other people. It can be just worshiping him. I had this acronym called ACTS. A-C-T-S. Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. Right? There's lots of mnemonics that you can help you learn and memorize about different types of prayer. Uh, the one that we're most familiar with is please God can I? Please God will you, right? That's the supplication. And then maybe close behind that is, oh my goodness, Lord, I'm sorry. For this sin, that would be the confession for but there's adoration prayer, and that's like the, the benediction. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. That one that we sing is really beautiful. So that's also praying. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of that at the very end because I really want to get through the next um, the next slide here. What time am I? Oh, I only have eight minutes. Okay, so let's really quickly go through through con so conversion because we started to do that, and let's let's do here slideshow from beginning okay so conversion no this is from last year sorry okay salvation is not a one-time proclamation right so in other faith traditions it's like are you saved did you ask jesus to come into your heart did you repent of your sins did you walk down an aisle take a pastor by the hand and say i want jesus to go to my heart and you pray the sinner's prayer 
throw it down the center, I don't deserve to go to heaven, I'm not going to be the Lord of my life, I'm a master, and I, that, that's what, what are you saying? A lot of people rest with me when they ask you that. For a Catholic, it's not a one-time proclamation. There has to be a first time that we do that, right? But it is a continual journey. And so conversion in this way is that we're saved in three tenses. We have been saved. And Romans and Ephesians and 2 Timothy, these verses, they're listed in your chain if you want to go read them. Um, it talks about I was saved yesterday, right, in the past tense. There's also I am being saved right now. And you can go and find this in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Philippians. Um, and then there is the we will, we shall be saved in the future. Father talked about this in his homily. Whenever we are the dead and Christ rise first, and then those who are living will be caught up into the air, that is the future tense of salvation. So it's not a one-time proclamation. Whereas this, I love this, this image, because Father Mark did this at St. Helena, this road to salvation, right? Redemption is different than salvation. Redemption is what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. When he died for us, so that he could make that, that there's a way for us now to be saved, right? Saved through grace, by faith through grace, by grace through faith, right? And salvation is possible for everyone. For everyone. Salvation is a personal decision and a choice, right? As Catholics, cradle Catholics, we bring our babies to be baptized, it's not a choice, right? They're baptized, they're confirmed, and then they then they, they begin as they as as a growing and maturing, then they begin to have been applied in their life. And as a convert, that's been a different way of approaching salvation for me. Because I was, you know, bad with my dad's bad scripture, I was, you know, take the by the hand, right? Do it. And so for me, this is a different, a different way of approaching this way of life. I also do a train track and get on the right track, right, of life. And so the on-ramp to get on this highway, this way, this path of salvation is baptism. You get on by being in the church. you got to be in the church, right? Baptism brings you into the church. Then you have these, the sacrament of confirmation. Then this life as you drive to be in the gifts of the Spirit, the fear of the Lord, knowledge, piety, fortitude, counsel, understanding, and wisdom, those gifts of the Holy Spirit that you get at confirmation then help you to live the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor spirit, those mourn, the meek, right? And then the boundaries of the road are the Ten Commandments. That's the fullest extent of yes is no. Right? No is a beautiful word. Because everything inside of these boundaries is a big yes. Although the way is narrow. <laughs> but these are the exterior boundaries. All of this is yes and this is no. And if you get up to the boundaries, then we have confession, we will call boxes. It's really this is a really cute little um, way of looking. And this is a, a, a show to help children at St. Helena. They do this in vacation Bible school. But that's in your book too. I don't have a whole lot of time to really dig into that. This is a whole probably couple of lessons in and of itself. But that's in your in your notes there. Okay. Um, okay, that was a question from last year. That was a question from last year. Go to this next one. Okay, so this metanoia, which is this profound change of heart. There are actually types of conversion, okay? There is a non-religious belief to a religious belief, right? I was atheist, now I'm not, right? That's one type of conversion. Then you have uh, an awareness of some lack in your life, right? This is, and then and this is what, ha is what happens when we are uh, confronted with our sin, right? We hear the word of God in such a way that it's like, ooh, my life doesn't really look like that. That's an awareness of some lack. Now, one of two things can happen. Either we can say, I'm open to exploring that further, which is painful. Or we can say, hmm, that's not true. I didn't really sin, and I'm fine. What we can't do is just stay there because it's too painful, right? We either agree with God, and we can be, and we repent, or we say, oh, I didn't sin, and then we live in this, this unreality that we've created for ourselves, right? And our culture is here, guys. That might be true for you, I see my truth is my truth. And that's the only way emotionally that we can deal with this awareness of this lack. I mean, the only way to really help ourselves and get rest and peace is to agree with God, right? Turn away from our sin and follow Him. But we can deal with it emotionally by creating a false reality and say, oh, well, my truth says that I'm fine, and you're crazy, and why are you so judgmental, and don't judge me, because who made you so holy? Cool? Did you hear that? I heard that, and I'm sort of really quickly, there was a woman 
who I was helping become Catholic. She was not atheist, but just kind of iffy, you know, just kind of love everybody kind of thing. So I'm teaching, I was helping her. I was not in her program, but anytime she had a question, she would call me. So I was walking her that she became Catholic. I went to New York and I spent a week with her uh, to do a conference. And we were walking through the streets of New York, and she's and then his old boyfriend, and she's married. His old boyfriend called me, and he asked me, I was like, oh, I was like, oh, that's probably flattering. And then I did it for like 20 years when she heard on this guy. I was like, oh, that's really flattering. She's like, yeah, well, what should I do? And I'm like, well, you can't go. You can't go. I can't tell you that because it's wrong. You're married. You have this husband. You, you know, she's like, oh, gosh, you're so right. You're right. How can you be friends with me? I'm such a terrible, terrible person. Why do you, why do you, you know, how can you? And I'm like, oh, stop, stop, stop right there. I love you. You're my friend. You're my friend. And I don't think you're a terrible person. You're judging yourself right now. Because if I'm right about what I'm saying, then you must be a bad person. That's what you're thinking. But I never said that. Because the shame that you feel is you passing judgment on your own life. I will pass judgment on you. I love you. And I'm going to love you no matter what. But if you want the truth, I'm going to tell you the truth. And she started crying. And she was like, you're so right. You did not shame me. I am shaming myself. I said, don't do that. Anytime we hear that shame, I must be bad. I must be messed up. That is the enemy talking to us. God never, ever speaks to his children, ever. He invites us to himself to come and to be cleansed and to be renewed and to be brought back into full communion with God. Never, you terrible sinner, how can you do that? If you're a real Christian, how could you do that? That is the voice of the enemy, never the voice of the Father. So that is a type of conversion, is awareness of some lack. And then there's also a conversion to a different faith tradition. Like I said, I was Baptist, now I'm Catholic. I'm not one of these Baptists that said, you know, I used to think Baptists were right, and then I found out Catholics were right, and God, I'm not a Baptist anymore. I am not one of those. I still feel very comfortable in the Baptist tradition. I have no problem going to a Baptist church. It's just they don't like it whenever I start to talk very much, because it, 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 it kind of, you know, they just, it just it feels wrong. And I like this. Who's this Catholic girl? She kind of sounds like us, but she kind of sounds like a Mary worshiper, too. <laughs> so there is that kind of conversion. But when I'm talking about the metanoia, that beautiful word of conversion, I am talking about that, that idea of being a, away from God, hearing him, and then coming back, right? Coming to the Lord. And this is called true repentance. True repentance. This is where I say, you know what? I agree with you, God, that this is, this is a sin in my life, and I want and I ask for your grace, and I confess it as such. This is wrong, and I am sorry, and I'm asking you to forgive me. And that is the metanoia that I'm talking about is true repentance. So conversion is actually fundamental, fundamental to the teaching of Christ. He began to preach saying, repent. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. At the very beginning, he was saying this. So that is a huge part of what Jesus talks about. Um, it is addressed to first those who don't know Christ, right? Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is at first addressed to those who don't know him. And then if you speak, and we already talked about this, if you say you know me um, and you don't do what I say, then you're a liar. But people who don't know Christ, they don't even realize that they're a slave to sin, right? They're a slave to sin. They're going to do it. We have to be awakened by this Holy Spirit living inside of us to break those chains of sin and death. And for people outside of that, they do not have the ability to do that. What, what, like what Father said, their works do not carry supernatural power because they are outside of Christ. They're outside of him. So this has been the uninterrupted task of the whole church is to proclaim Christ and, 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 and talk and say, right, faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the word of God. The uninterrupted task of the church is to proclaim the word of God. Proclaim, proclaim, proclaim. It is a whole heck of a lot easier, though, for me to stand up here and proclaim it than it is for me to actually do it in my life. And I, and I go back to that darkness. That dark time taught me the importance of the doing, the doing, and the continued doing, even when nobody recognizes it. 
is so, so important because if I got up here and I started talking about all this stuff in my life, did not mirror and actually look like what I was teaching you, I'd be the worst kind of hypocrite. And, I, and, and that's, you know, so I say whatever I place before you, I also hold myself to that same standard. And if you see my life not looking like that, I want you to hold me accountable. I want you to. We need each other. My goodness, if I'm not living a life of holiness, I hope, yeah, you're like, I want that. I need that. Um, you know, it says in the scriptures, not many of you should be aspiring to become teachers because you'll be held to a higher standard. And there are days where I'm like, yes, Lord, hold me to that standard. And there are some days I'm like, why did you make me a teacher? No, please don't do that. Okay. But God continues to give us a new heart. And this is the prodigal son, right? The son, the prodigal son who was with his father, then he left his father, then he came back to his father. So this is a story for us. We are like the prodigal son. I have been every single character in that story. Even father, right? Now that I'm a mother. Before I was a mother, I was either the prodigal son or the good son. It's like, why are you killing the cow for just numb nuts, God? God, oh my gosh, he's crazy. So, but he continues to give us a, a, a new heart. And this process of conversion of repentance is a lifetime process. Okay, so I have gone over just a little bit. Is anybody going to learn the podcast? You are. Okay, so you need to get out of here. Okay, so I have what, like, I have like 10 minutes left. Okay, so let's talk about prayer really quickly. So like I said, prayer is not something that you do. It's something that you participate in that God is doing. So let's go flip to um, page number four in your notes. and I stick over that, three and four. Okay. Is there any more books that people can make their money? Oh, are all the books gone? I'll have to make some more copies. Yeah. You know what I can pass them. Yeah, we can share. Yeah, okay, I'll make more copies. I have more. I do, I have more, so I'll make more next time. Okay, so we look at page three. This is about prayer and our books, okay? So I'm, we're not going to have time to go through all of this, but this is really great because it has places in the catechism where you can um, where you can read what we're talking about here. This is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I have not read the whole thing, but every time I read it, it, it I mean, it's, there's so much wealth and knowledge here. So let's just go over a couple of things, right? So let's flip. So then this catechism has a whole section on prayer. But let me see what I want to go over with you. Some of the quotes that I had. Okay, on page two, prayer is covenant. Prayer is covenant. Where does prayer come from? Whether prayer is expressed in words or gestures, it is a whole man who prays. But in naming the source of prayer, scripture speaks sometimes about the soul or the spirit, but most often the heart. So that heart, like that innermost sanctuary inside of you that nobody is privy to, unless you share it with them, but even then, even then, there's still a part of you. As well as I know my husband, we've married for 20 years. As well, he can tell what I'm, what, even if my breathing changes, he's like, what's going on? He knows me, right? Same, I know, whatever he's not, I'm like, what's, what, there's something, just by our breathing, right? But there's still a part of me that is simply mine. And no matter how much I want to try to share it with him, I will never be able to share my face off, right? That's the place. So that is the heart. If our heart is far from God, the words of prayer are in vain. And like, not that he doesn't hear us, but if our, and what that means is if we are speaking and we don't want God, right? We're just like, da 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 There's no interior change. Like God wants to get into that spot, right? Okay. The heart is the joint place where I am, where I live. According to the cynical or biblical expression, the heart is to the place where I withdraw. So these are all such beautiful. I mean, it takes a like, time to really sit with these and really contemplate them. And so Christian prayer is a covenant relationship between God and the man and Jesus. It's the action of God and man springing forth from the Holy Spirit, right? So prayer is a, an unction of the Holy Spirit. We enter into that place with, with God. Okay. I want to go over some common errors. This is on page four. So prayer starts with us, it's something we do, that is an error. Prayer is talking to God. It also is with listening, right? I can da 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 Who has never had a friend? They just won't shut up. I'm probably that friend right now. <laughs> Quite frankly, right? Just da 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 And it's like, where is their space for me? Right? And so we have to listen as well. Um, 
Liturgy and my personal prayer life have nothing to do with each other. This is so, so important. What we do in the liturgy flows from and is fed from what we are doing at home with our prayer life at home. This is the same as true with our sins, y'all. My sins, they affect you personally. They affect the church in Africa and in Asia. Even though they may not know me personally, my sin affects the entire body of Christ. We are all affected. We rise as a body, and we fall as a body as a body. All the more reason for us to hold one another accountable in love and in holiness and in virtue. My personal relationship with God is important, but this ex, this, this vertical uh, horizontal relationship with you is equally important. Remember, God trusts people. God trusts people. He entrusts himself to people, to a group of people that we have called the church, the ecclesia, the ones who are called out. We are called out together as a body. It's beautiful. Um, and then this one is really, really important. If you don't receive what you ask for in prayer, it is because you did not have enough faith. <sighs> Lies. And this is never more poignant than when a child is suffering or when you pray for healing and healing that to come. I prayed so hard, God, and that's not a kind of faith. No, that is not true. There's a bigger picture. There's some other something that God is doing. We know, and we know that we know that we know that God is good. And all things work together for good for those who are loved and called according to his purposes. So even that most awful thing that you prayed would never, ever, ever happen. If it happens, there is a reason for it. And if we don't know what it is on this side of eternity, we will know eventually. And it will be beautiful, and it will be good, and we will see that it could not have happened any other way. Okay, so just because you don't receive what you ask for in prayer has nothing to do with whether or not you have enough faith. Okay, let's move over to page. I guess I didn't put it in there. Oh, yes, 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 I did. Page eight. Okay. God thirsts for us. He wants us. I remember the first time that dawned on me. God wants me. I was like 26 or 27. And I, and I was reading uh, an, an allegory in the Old Testament. I won't go into that much because I don't have time. But it, I was, God spoke to me, and he had said, I want you, Allison. And it was profound. He yearns for us. And so in the catechism, he talks about his, his yearning. He says, why do they go to wells that will not fill them up? They are going to these wells with buckets with holes in them. I wish they would come. And so when we come to God, we are not bothering him. And that was a huge thing, too, because as a mom, sometimes those little ones that just need, 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 it's like, oh, my God. I love you. <laughs> God never, ever, ever said that. And I had to be a mom before I really, really grasped that. Because I prayed when I first held David, my oldest son, my name is the on the It's beautiful, beautiful boy. And I said, God, teach me to love him the way that you love me. And one of those times when he came to me, and I was so irritated and so just done. His little eyes and he's needing. And it dawned on me. Never irritated with us. When we come knocking, he's not like, okay. Son? What do you need? He's never said that. He wants us to come to him. He yearns and thirsts for us. And so when we knock, we're like, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. He says, I'm here. That's how I want to respond to my kids. Now, sometimes I can do it, and sometimes I just can't. But I know that's how God responds. I know that's how he responds. And then the other thing that I wanted to, to mention before we pray is the widow. The widow who keeps knocking, right, and asking, hey, this is real, right? Hey, it's me again. It's me again, God. It's me again. He's never irritated about that. Jesus actually gives us that as an example of how to do it. <laughs> Keep asking. Keep asking. Ask, seek, knock. The door will be open, right? He says that to us. Okay. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. Actually, I am right on time.
Father, will you close us in prayer today? Can I impose on you like that? You the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we praise you and bless you for your goodness. That you have created each and every one of us out of love, that you call us to deeper love with you. That you know the needs of our hearts, you know all the burdens that we carry. You know everything about us, the delight in us. We ask for the grace to always be mindful of that truth and to be moved with great confidence to make a gift of ourselves to you that you may continue to pour more and more of yourself into us, that you may reveal yourself to us more, and that in your life you may come to know who we are to you as well. And that you continue to, to open our minds to your truth. We ask for the grace of understanding, and we grasp, ask for an insatiable hunger to know you and to receive your love. We ask that you protect and guard all that was received during this time. Oh, graces, do not let the enemy come to steal anything from us. Send your angels to stand guard around us and protect us. To continue to enlighten us, protect us as we go forth from here. Inform us more and more into the likeness of your son, Jesus, in whose name we now pray. Amen. Amen. Okay.